Okay, welcome to Bhakti Sangha Chapa Conference Call. Today we are very fortunate to have His Holy Name, His uh, Chandra Mali Maharaj, to enlighten us on Srimad Bhagavatam as well as on the glories of Lord Vaman Dev. So today is the very auspicious day of uh, Ikadashi. So we are very fortunate to have Maharaj. So. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory is to Srila Prabhupada, all glory is to Guru Maharaj. So, thank you so much, Maharaj, for giving your valuable association and time. So, now I would like to hand over the call to you. Thank you so much, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya. Krishna Krishnaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi, Pastyakya De Satarine, Panchakalpa to Bischa Kripa Sindhu, the Avacha, the Titan on Pavane, Yo Vaishnave, Yo Maho Maha. Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadar Har, Sri Vasa Vigor, Bhakti Vrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So, I was requested to uh, make this a dual presentation in that uh, to read the verse and speak on the verse, which is from the fourth canto, chapter 28, verse number 40, Paranjana becomes a woman in the next life. And then also speak on, uh, I'm not sure how you're celebrating it in the US, but I know here we're celebrating tomorrow as the uh, appearance day of Vamanadev. So we'll speak a little something about uh, the appearance of the personality of Godhead, Sri Vamana Deva also. So I'll read the verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. And I, I trust everyone has been uh, following the sequence. So this verse is in the sequence of verses. Savyapa kata yat manam yati kata yat mani vidvam swapnam ivam marsa saksinam viraram naha. Translation King Maladwaja, King Malaya Dwaja, attained perfect knowledge by being able to distinguish the super soul from the individual soul. The individual soul is localized, whereas the super soul is more pervasive. He became perfect in knowledge that the material body is not the soul, but that the soul is the witness of the material body. So Srila Prabhupada's purport, and we'll speak on the purport as we read. The conditioned soul is often frustrated in trying to understand the distinctions between the material body, the super soul, and the individual soul. Read the sweet on that. But there are two types of Mayavadi philosophers, the followers of the Buddhist philosopher philosophy, and the followers of the Shankara philosophy. The followers of Buddha do not recognize that there is anything beyond the body. The followers of Shankar conclude that there is no separate existence of the Paramahma, the super soul. The Shankarites believe that the individual soul is identical with the Paramahma in the ultimate analysis. But the Vaishnava philosopher who is perfect in knowledge knows that the body is made of the external energy and that the super soul, the Paramahma, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is situated within the individual soul and is distinct from him. As Lord Krishna states in the Bhagavad Gita, Sreta Sarva Sreti Bharata, 
ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಜಯೋ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಯತ್ತ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಮತ ಮಮ ಓಸ್ಕೀನ್ ಬರ್ಡ್ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದಟ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ದ ನೋವರ್ ಇನ್ ಆಲ್ ಬಾಡೀಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟು ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ದಿಸ್ ಬಾಡಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಓನರ್ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಮೈ ಒಪಿನಿಯನ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೆಟಿಂಗ್ ಅ ಲಿಟಲ್ ಕ್ಲಾರಿಫಿಕೇಶನ್ which is often a confusion for many spiritualists between the individual soul and the super soul uh, there are a class of spiritualists who say that there's only the super soul is in the body and that super soul and the individual soul are the same in that that the supreme personality of godhead doesn't exist within the body but he manifests himself as an individual soul and that individual soul also becomes the living entity so these are philosophers they are known as maya bodies they accept everything to be god in other words there are two things there is god and there is the material energy material energy is false and god is truth and there is no separate existence between the super soul and the individual soul in fact the individual soul and the super soul are the same they consider each living entity to be the supreme only that the supreme has somehow rather manifested a material body in this world they can't explain why at least in logical terms they give some understanding based on their own speculations but they say that perfection means to come back to realize that you are the supreme and the individual soul and the super soul may be distinct in the material energy but once you reach spirituality in other words you reach perfection you understand there's no difference but here it's clearly mentioned that the super soul is in everybody and the individual soul is localized and krishna explains clearly in the 13th chapter he says i am the knower in all bodies and to know this body and the field of knowledge or the field of activities is actually called knowledge okay. So then he goes on to say Prabhupada says the body is taken to be the field and the individual soul is taken to be the worker of the field. So we're given this material body due to our desires to become separate from the Lord. So to fulfill that desire and to give the facility of that soul to enjoy the material manifestation is presented and the living entity comes here and takes on a material body. and in wanting to enjoy in the material world one has to identify with themselves as being the body so that identification is called ahankara or false it has nothing to do with the real identity of the soul but yet in the material world um because it is cut off from the original existence it is seen as uh separate but the individual soul is always connected to the supreme soul and in the material world the illusion of separateness continues and therefore one tries to find happiness through the mind the intelligence and the senses like that and that's called the field of activity which is the material body This 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita which is given reference here is one of the more philosophical chapters in the Bhagavad Gita it teaches um uh gyan transcendental knowledge in the understanding of the three aspects of ex- of existence the soul the supreme soul and material energy and their interaction and their interrelationship with others to study that 13th chapter it's worth a study there's one book that was published many years ago years ago called the 13th chapter and in that 
publication, there is many, many purports and explanations on each of the verses. It's a very important chapter to understand the relationship between these two, three aspects of existence. Now, the super soul, although it's in the body, it doesn't perform any activities in relationship with the body. It becomes what is called uh, the witness. Krishna explains that I am the witness. Please don't make noise. Sorry about that. So the witness is Krishna, who is keeping account of the, <clears throat> excuse me, of the living entity's activities within this material body. And we, the individual soul, in our field of activities, which is this material body, we extend that field beyond the body in terms of everything in relationship to the body, such as family, friends, society, country, and everything that's connected with our body, either directly or indirectly. And that is our field of enjoyment or the proposed field of enjoyment like that. So it says here, the individual soul works and enjoys the fruits of the body, whereas the super soul witnesses the activities, but does not enjoy the fruits of activities. So he mentioned that the super soul is present in every field of activity, whereas the individual soul is present in his localized body. So Krishna explains that in the Bhagavad Gita, where he mentions that uh, everywhere are the, his eyes and faces and he, his, he, his heads and his mouth, he hears everything he is present in all bodies simultaneously. So the Lord manifests his, his uh, individual mercy manifestation to accompany a living entity in this world. So here it goes on to end the purport by saying, King Malaya Dwajana attained this perfection of knowledge and was able to distinguish the soul and the super soul and the soul and the material body. So, the perfection of understanding, knowledge, is to make the, this distinction between the three, the soul, the super soul, and the material body, like that. <laughs> and uh, realizing that each one is eternal and each one is individual. When I say eternal in relationship to the material body, it means that there will always be material bodies in the material world. Your individual body is not eternal. The ingredients that make up the individual body are eternal. So in the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna nicely explains what comprises the entire manifested material energy in its different forms but breaking the forms down into their basic ingredients, we come with, up with earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. So we put that all together and we have a material body. So that's what our material body is. It's just earth, water, fire, air, ether, and a principle which is called mind, intelligence, which is discrimination, and the, sen the false sense of self, which is related to material energy. This makes up everything material. So when you understand what is not you, which are these ingredients and how they form themselves, and you actually understand you're separate from all this, this is called self-realization. And then there's God realization is that when you understand that there is God is also accompanying you in that body and you realize the presence of the Lord within the, your body and in the body of all others 
as Krishna mentions, Vidya, Vinaya, Sampane, Brahmani Gavi Hastini, Suni Chaiva, Swapakecha, Pandita Samadarshanaha. Pandita Samadarshanaha. I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. Excuse me for that. I had to I, do one little thing. Here. <clears throat> so one, this is actually knowledge to know that God is in your heart and in the hearts of all living entities. And therefore one doesn't see separation or separateness between oneself and another living being because everyone is connected on the spiritual platform. Therefore, when you talk about brotherhood or humanity, we can understand there is an, an element of connection that connects all living entities together. And that's the fact that we are all spiritual beings. And then in the heart of every living being, God is personally present. Okay, so these are some points on this particular verse. And then... Uh, I'll stop here and go into a little bit of a narration of um, tomorrow's uh, holy day, which is the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, Ramana Day. The Lord comes to this material world for many purposes. But he mentions those three that are three of his main purposes are one, to establish or reestablish religious principles once they have been lost, to remove those individuals that are the cause of your religion, and to uh, give pleasure to his devotees. And so the Lord appears from time to time throughout the history of mankind to fulfill these three propensities. Now, he can relieve uh, the demons of their, uh, what we say, mischievousness without coming pur purposely. He can also reestablish religious principles by sending someone from, his, from the spiritual world who is his personal representative. But he personally comes to give pleasure to his devotees. <clears throat> so the Lord manifests himself in different forms. In his form as Vamana Dev, he manifested his outstanding quality of beauty. Out of all of the attractive qualities that the Lord exhibits, the quality of beauty is most attractive for the devotees of the Lord. <clears throat> the beauty of the Lord is, what we say, overwhelmingly attractive, and he manifests that beauty in different manifestations of his appearance. In Vamana Dev, he is known as a beautiful, beautiful dwarf Brahmana. Why did he come? Well, there was a battle in the heavenly planets between the demons and the demigods. And the demons were getting defeated. And one demon, who was a, one of the leaders of the demons, his name was Bali Maharaj. He was killed at the fight. But his spiritual master, Sukhacharya, who was a powerful personality, had the power to revive his disciple. And so he brought him back to life. And when he came back to life, he again organized the fight against the demigods. When the demons attacked this time, the heavenly realms, the demigods 
saw the prowess of Bali coming along with many, many powerful chieftains of the demons and their armies. The uh, demigods went to Brihaspati, said what to do. Brihaspati says, it will be not possible to defeat the demons in this situation. Bali has tremendous power. Better you just leave the heavenly plants and hide, <laughs> at least for the time being. Taking up the instructions of their spiritual master, Brihaspati, the demons, the demigods became invisible. Bali took over all the planetary systems from the lower planetary systems all the way up to the higher planetary systems and became the controller and proprietor of everything. And now we switch a little bit to Aditi. Aditi is the mother of many of the demigods. Seeing her sons being uh, ridiculed and ousted from their situation, she was concerned. She approached her husband, Kishapa. Kishapa preached the important and the understanding that one should not be attached to anything material in this world. Um, although she listened, she wasn't able to accept his teachings. So then he gave her another instructions that um, you can uh, prepare for the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead by performing this pale Vrata sacrifice. He taught her the sacrifice. She performed the sacrifice. At the end of the sacrifice, she had performed it so expertly that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vamanadev, appeared as her son. And as described in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the beauty of Vamanadev as he appears, uh, it's very nicely described, his beauty. Uh, his forehands were decorated with conch shell, club, lotus, and disc. He was dressed in yellow garments and his eyes appeared like petals of a blooming lotus. His body was blackish in complexion, lotus face decorated with earrings resembling sharks. He appeared very beautiful and on his bosom was the mark of the Srivats. He wore bangles on his wrists armlets on his arms, a helmet on his head, a belt on his waist, a sacred thread across his chest and ankle bells decorating his lotus feet. He was wearing an uncommonly beautiful flower garland and flowers were extremely fragrant with bees humming all around. The Lord appeared wearing his kastuba gem which is unique to the Lord's appearance. His effulgence and vanquished the darkness of the home of Kishapa. There was happiness in all directions and the earth was jubilant. The hills, the mountains, the rivers, the streams, the oceans and all living entities were filled with joy. Now in mentions, he's, he appeared on the 12th day of the bright fourth moon of the month of Bhadra which is tomorrow. When the moon came, he formed a very auspicious constellation and it's described here. So the Lord appeared and it's called Vamana Dwadisi, which follows the Akadasi. And then it describes the glorification coming from the different higher beings. They're all glorifying the Lord. And then the Lord was decorated so nicely, but yet he was given so many other gifts by his mother. And she gave him, it's mentioned here, Mother Earth gave him a deer skin. The demigod of the moon uh, gave him a, dun, a Brahman danda. His mother gave him a cloth for underwear. And an umbrella was given, a sacred thread was given. Uh, 
and a straw belt was given. So many gifts were given to the Lord. After the Lord was received nicely, he went on to his mission. What was his mission? To visit the assembly of Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj was the king of the demons and he was very inclined to give charity to brahmanas. Many brahmanas were there in his assembly and because the brahmanas had favored Bali, Bali and the demons were what we say unconquerable. <laughs> Sometimes you see that, of course nowadays people don't perform any austerities, but in, but in Vedic culture, both the demons and the devas would perform austerities. And many times the, dem the demigods, I mean, I'm sorry, the demons would receive the favor of the brahmanas. And because of receiving the favors of the brahmanas by performing austerities to please them, they became powerful and received many, many boons in return. We have the example of Haranika Sipu who pleased Lord Ramana. So when Bali came into the assembly, I'm sorry, when Bamana came into the assembly of Bali Maharaj, an effulgence spread throughout the whole assembly. The Brahmanas who were sitting immediately rose from their seats and offered prayers and respects to this honored guest. Bali Maharaj immediately got down from his throne, welcomed the Lord and washed his feet. Bali, uh, the Lord was wearing a Brahmin thread so Bali could understand, oh, here is a very saintly and learned Brahmana. Therefore, and being overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord, his beauty, and just by his presence, Bali, Bali's mind and heart was attracted to the lotus feet of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me, and devotion. Bali is expert and very, what we say, magnanimous in giving out charity. So he said to Vamana Dev, you've come from such a noble family and you are able to give charity more. I'm sorry, that's the wrong verse here. He said, he, he greeted the Lord nicely and the Lord also started to glorify Bali as being the um, grandson of Prahlad Maharaj. He spoke about Harani Kasipu, how Harani Kasipu was angry at uh, Lord Vishnu for killing his brother Haranyaksha, and how Harani Kasipu looked everywhere in the universe trying to find Vishnu. He couldn't find Vishnu, so he concluded that Vishnu was no longer existing. So there's a nice glorification of all the family members of Bali Maharaj by the Lord. The Lord is glorifying Rani Kashipu, Rani Aksha, Palad Maharaj, Virochana, Bali Maharaj's father. How he was very affectionate towards the Brahmanas. He said, you are also expert at religious principles. All your father, forefathers are great heroes. You come from the, I have come to only ask for three paces of land, the measurements of my steps. The Lord said, O oh, king, controller of the, although you are very magnificent and I will give me as much land as I want. I do not want anything from you that is unnecessary. And then this is an interesting verse. If a learned Brahmin takes charity from others only according to his needs, he does not become entangled in sinful activities. And Prabhupada's purport is very illuminating and explaining how 
one should accept charity according to one's need and uh, not be greedy for more. Of course, sometimes brahmanas will receive, sannyasis will receive, gurus will receive much more charity than they actually you, you need on the personal level. So they will take it and use it to spread Krishna consciousness or use it for the benefit of others like that. Bali Maharaj seems to be a little insulted by uh, Bhamana's request, being very magnanimous and willing to give whatever Bhamana Dev asks. He, he says, you're not very intelligent. <laughs> Your intelligence is insufficient. Uh, I, I'm the proprietor of the universe. What will your three steps of land do? You're only a small boy. You may, you may ask for me anything you wish, and I am prepared to fulfill your request. And then we have a key verse. My dear king, the Lord responds, even the entirety of what there may be within the three worlds to satisfy one's senses cannot satisfy a person whose senses are uncontrolled. This is a, a very instructive statement. We find that there is an element, a very strong element, in this world called greed. Greed destroys all good qualities. Because people are greedy, they uh, suffer. And because there's greed, everyone suffers. It's one of the more uh, uh, destructive qualities, greediness. Prabhupada gives the example that <clears throat> animals will take well, what they need to live and that's all. They'll take what they need, they won't store for the future. But then one devotee in a discussion with Prabhupada said, well, we see that there are people who go fishing and they put the hook with the bait in the ocean and uh, uh, the fish comes and because of that, he loses his life. <clears throat> Prabhupada says, yes, that is called greediness. So sometimes the fish will become greedy, although there's enough food within the water <clears throat> supplied by the Lord. So sometimes even animals <clears throat> will act in that way. So greed is a very, what we say, destructive quality for the character of the living entity. And this material world, <clears throat> people are never satisfied because material life cannot bring satisfaction. When a person has money, they want more money. A person has mm, so many opportunities for sense gratification, they want more. The idea of becoming satisfied is never reached. But the idea of trying to get more seems to be the main absorption of the living entity. Absorb himself in getting more and more and more. <clears throat> I remember when I was traveling in America <clears throat> and driving in my automobile, at times we would notice bumper stickers on other cars. <clears throat> and it was one bumper sticker that I thought was quite interesting and amusing, but at the same time, very much instructive as a principle of life and the bumper said sticker said one who dies with the most toys wins <clears throat> so this is kind of like facetious sarcastic but it makes a point that people are just accumulating more and more and more and then ultimately they die. <clears throat> so what is the use? Sometimes I have the experience because I travel a lot. We go to 
individuals' homes, and people have so much junk, they don't even know what to do with it. Uh, I see in America, especially, they have these uh, big gigantic warehouses which line the highways of America, huge gigantic places for storage. And people buy these storage places or they rent them, I'm not sure. And they just store all kinds of stuff. Don't even use it, or if they use it, it's just occasional. So one of the principles <clears throat> that is highly emphasized in the, in the Vedas, it's mentioned in the Upanishads, and particularly in the Sri Isha Upanishads, which says, Ishavasham idam sarvam yatkinjata jaga tena japtena bundi jaha magridaha kashiswidanam. And translation is everything owned, everything animate and inanimate in this world is owned and controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but one is entitled to their quota. That is verse number one. And verse number two explains if one lives according to this principle, that is living according to your needs, not to you, not to the griefs. Then the verse, second verse goes, then one can aspire to live for hundreds of years. Uh, our Western civilization is raping the earth, destroying the earth, simply to create more and more junk that people don't need. It's polluting people's minds, it pollutes people's existence, and it's raping the earth of its natural resources. So this goes on as uh, what they say, uh, economic advancement. They use nice terms to somehow or other cover over what is actually the reality. Uh, I remember I was traveling and I was at one person's house and he was telling me that there's people who they study your spending habits by understanding by through your computer they can understand how you buy where you buy what you buy and then they bombard you with similar items of interest through various types of advertising like that knowing that these are the things that you're interested in so this goes on as economic development uh, uh, material franchising or but actually it is simply sinful activity that pollutes the earth and pollutes, pollutes people's minds so Bhamana Dave is making a nice point here that one whose mind and senses are uncontrolled, no matter how much they get, they're never satisfied. And one whose mind and senses in, are under control and fixed on the Lord, it doesn't matter how much they have or they don't have, they're happy. The principle is happiness and not material acquisitions. And so material things cannot give you happiness. As it's explained, nowadays people have a tendency to put material items over personal relationships. They value material items more important than relationships with other living beings and sometimes kill each other over these things. Mm -hmm. So this, this goes on today as so-called advancement of society, but it's actually demoniac culture. So Vamana Dev is making a nice point. Now, uh, Sukracharya, he's sitting by. Of course, the Lord goes on to say how other great kings and maharajas had proprietorship over the earth but never achieved satisfaction. And the Lord says, 
something interesting. He said, one should be satisfied with whether he achieves by his personal de destiny for discontent will never bring happiness. A person who is not self-control will not be happy even possessing the three worlds. And the Lord goes on to explain his principle in more and more detail. Therefore, he says, I only ask for three places of land. Now, Sukracharya, the spiritual master of, Bama, of uh, Bali, is sitting there and listening to all this. Now, Sukracharya is concerned. He understands that this is Vishnu, and Vishnu's come on behalf of the demigods to take back all the possessions of the demigods. And therefore, he starts preaching that you have promised to give it him, but you did not chant the word Om. Therefore, you do not have to fulfill your promise. Because when one says Om, before one makes a vow, then one cannot withdraw from that promise. But you did not chant Om, so therefore, you can, you can withdraw from that vow. And then, of course, uh, Sukracharya, in a very detailed explanation, explains what's going to happen if Bali Maharaj goes along with fulfilling his promise to Vamanadev. And then he ends, this ends the chapter. <clears throat> and he's encouraging his, of course, we understand from the commentaries of the Acharyas that Sukracharya was a hired Brahmana, although he was a powerful spiritual teacher. He was in the line of seminal Brahmanas and he came Bali, and he was living very nicely by the grace of Bali Maharaj's acquisitions. So he was also concerned that now, if Bali gives everything away to the Lord, he'll, he won't have anything for himself. Like that. And so it goes on to explain how Bali finally rejects the words of his spiritual master. And it's interesting because this is a point of discussion. One cannot disobey the spiritual master. But then again, there's another principle that is alive in this, this, this narration. And what is that principle? Is that the spiritual master is supposed to bring one to the Lord. And here the spiritual master is taking one away from the Lord. So therefore, the spiritual master becomes, what we say, uh, asara. Asara means he has no more ability in that role as a spiritual master. He becomes useless. So now becoming useless by speaking against the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Bali Maharaj understands and rejects the instructions of his spiritual master and offers three steps of land. And of course, we understand the Lord on his first step, it took the lower and middle planetary systems. And on the second step, took the higher planetary systems. And now being promised three steps, the Lord turns to Bali and says, you have given me three steps. I have taken only two. You are a thief. You don't, I have one more step that you have promised me. There's no place to put it. Therefore, you are punishable. So the Lord turns around now, wants to punish Bali Maharaj for going against his promise, saying that you are, you made your promise and now you cannot fulfill your promise. Prahlad Maharaj somehow or other comes at that particular time and seeing the situation. At that time, uh, the Lord calls for the ropes of a Sugi. The Sugi comes, ties up Bali Maharaj and like a criminal, and now he is punishable by the Lord. Bali uh, Pallad Maharaj uh, appears, and seeing Pallad Maharaj, his grandfather, who was a great saint, uh, Bali Maharaj offered beautiful prayers to Prahlad. And when he did, his mind became illuminated 
but what to do. And then he understood, oh yes, I have a place for the third step, my dear Lord. Please place that third step on my head. And so the Lord understood. Now Bali has come to his complete surrender. And therefore he surrendered everything to the Lord and uh, gave up everything is into a, to become the servant of the Lord. Uh, the pastime goes on how the Lord was very pleased with Bali Maharaj and uh, awarded him a place in the place called uh, Suta, Sutala, where Bali Maharaj would have his own planet and at the same time the Lord would be his personal servant in that planet. And so the Lord became the personal servant in another manifestation of himself and that is still today existing. Uh, the Lord is the personal servant of Bali Maharaj but because Bali Maharaj followed religious principles, knows religious principles, although he was a demon, he, uh, he acted in a, in a godly way, and therefore he is known as one of the Mahada, Mahajans. A Mahajan is known as a person who knows the truth of all religious principles. Mahajano yena katasa panta, Panta means path. Mahajano Yena, one should follow in the path of the Mahajans who teach eternal religious principles. There's one verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam where Yamaraj, who is one of the Mahajans, lists all of the Mahajans. There are 12 Mahajans. Bali Maharaj is one of them. He is also known as the person who teaches full surrender unto the personality of Godhead. Of the nine angas of devotional service, two of them becoming a friend to the Lord and surrendering everything to the Lord was uh, is on the platform of spontaneous devotional service. The other seven are within the category of Vaidhi Bhakti but becoming a friend and surrendering everything is only done in Raganuga Bhakti. And Bali Maharaj was the personification of the perfection of surrendering everything to the Lord. And the Lord was very pleased. Uh, but a lot of the personalities around his Sukracharya, he was so angry, he cursed his... Uh, his uh, <clears throat> disciple, uh, Jai Pataka Maharaj, tells a little interesting story, which I don't remember all the details. But when, uh, when uh, Bali Maharaj was about to make the promise using his water pot to consummate the problem, Sukracharya uh, actually transformed himself into a a fly to block the water from coming out. But somehow or other, uh, Vamanadev saw that and punctured the eye of the fly. And uh, because of that, uh, there was 150 years where from the time of Lord Chaitanya's associates had left the planet, when all of Lord Chaitanya's associates had left the planet. At the time when Bhakti Thakur reawakened Lord Chaitanya's movement, it was 150 years. And in 150 years, Kali Yuga, um, or uh, uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement, was blocked. It was blocked during those 150 years. And after the 150 year was over, it was a curse that was put upon uh, because of that offense to uh, Sukracharya. Well, actually, he committed the offense, but got the reaction of the offense. This is an interesting pastime. I think you'll have to speak to Jai Pataka Maharaj, who knows all the details of that. But for 150 years, uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement was checked. And it was only to the appearance of Bhakti Vinod Thakur that that 150 years was finished. And then Lord Chaitanya's movement started again, move forward. 
So this is an interesting point. So this is a wonderful pastime. Um, Bali Maharaja's sister, her name was Ratna, Ratna Bahu or something, Ratna something, I can't remember her name. She became, when she saw Vamana Dev, she became overwhelmed with maternal affection. Her loving mo motherly mood poured out of her heart. But then after seeing how Vamana Dev took everything away from her brother, she became angry at the Lord. So she exhibited this combination of maternal affection and anger. And in a later birth, she took birth as Putana witch and uh, was killed by uh, Krishna. And then, of course, because she had that maternal affection from a previous life, the Lord actually elevated her to a very high stage of liberation on the same level as Mother Yasoda. And so that's an interesting point. With that. And of course, now that the all the possessions were back within the demigod, the demigods took over. And then, of course, as you read, there is another battle. And the demigods again fight with the demons, and the demons are easily destroyed, and the demigods take over the heavenly realms again, like that. So this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful narration of the Lord's Leelas on how the Lord uh, is always inclined to please his devotees. And sometimes he makes personal appearance in order to bring religious principles back and to give happiness and joy and uh, opportunities for his devotees to associate with him. Okay, so um, these are some of the pastimes. Tomorrow is also the appearance of Jiva Goswami. So tomorrow is a wonderful day, both appearance of a great Acharya and at the same time the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Like that, so that's Vaman Dwadasi, like that, and therefore, uh, we don't follow the fast on the Akadasi because one cannot break it on the appearance day of the Lord. One has to break the fast and therefore one cannot fast on the appearance day of the, I mean, one cannot break the fast of the appearance day of the Lord. And therefore we're fasting tomorrow, uh, half a day for Raman Dwadasi like that. And the Titi for breaking the fast is on uh, on the following day. Like that. So it's an interesting, more, most unusual combination of uh, uh, ikadasi, duadasi, uh, fasting, and breakfast. Okay, so make sure you get that right. I've, se I've seen in the future the devotees sometimes make a mistake. Uh, I'm here in Europe. I'm not sure exactly how it's done whether your schedule is the same. But tomorrow we honor Vamana's appearance day and we also uh, fast for the Akadasi on the same day. And then the following day we break the fast like that. So Vaman Dwadasi becomes the fast for the Akadasi. Okay, and these are some, you know, uh, points that we might find useful. All right, so we'll open it up to any comments or questions on either the verse we spoke on from the fourth canto or on the appearance of Vamana, Vamana Devi. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Um, yeah, I'm actually confused about the fasting rules. Now, in my neck of the woods, Ekadasi is today. And we are supposed to break our fast tomorrow morning. So um, can you 
kind of explain again how this works? Is, is today Vamana appearance day for you? Yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. Maharaj, um, in US we are celebrating today the Ekadashi. And and Vamana yeah, also. And, uh, appearance day of Lord Vamana. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's fine. And tomorrow, so you fast on the Ekadasi and you also, but today was a half a day fast in the morning, right? Yes, Maharaj. Although, although it's the Ekadasi, you also fast a half a day for Vamana. And tomorrow you break the fast, that's all. Okay. So the extra is that you fast in the morning today from all foods along with fasting on the Ekadasi. And so we're supposed to break our fast at noon today? No, no, tomorrow. So yeah. we should fast. Yeah, we should fast. You can take a codice prashadam at noon. Yeah. You take a codice prashadam today only, but you break the codice fast tomorrow according to the TT. Oh, okay, so full fast today until noon, and then you break the fast with um, Ekadasi Prasadam at noon. So you're not breaking any fast. You're simply taking, if you want to take Prasadam today, you can only take Ekadasi Prasadam, or else you can follow the fast for the whole day if you want. Okay, and then, and then break... And then In other words, the today's prashadam tomorrow. is only a cut. Yeah. Yeah, with grains. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's the grain break. Right, right. Or and, for those who for those who do near job, um, they would do near job for the entire day and then break the fast tomorrow. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, then the Hat Pranam, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, all glory to you, Padma. Maharaj, uh, I, I have, have a, Your volume is too low. I can hardly hear you. Uh, can you hear me, Maharaj, now? It's a little better, but go higher. Okay, I will, I will try to be louder, Maharaj. So, you mentioned a book on chapter 13 of Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, can it was done by. Um, it was done by, uh, what's his name? One of our former sannyasis. Uh, can't think of his name. Is the book still available, Maharaj? Uh, I have a oh, copy. I have a copy. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's still available. It's by, it's by, it's by, it's by Harry Keshwar. Okay, okay, okay. So it's not, I mean, to buy it doesn't, may not be available, right? Um, do some searching around. Go see if you can find it on Amazon. So uh, can, can uh, I mean, uh, is this, what's the name of the book, Maharaj, so that we can it's search? It's called 13th chapter. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Yeah, I just wanted to. Harikesh Maharaj. You. And that was, that was published at least 30 years ago, though. <laughs> Okay, I can try to find the. Thank you, Maharaj, for telling it. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Nowadays, you can find anything. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. More questions, comments? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your Lord to speak Guru Maharaj. Is Shamarani speaking? Um, 
Okay. I just have uh, one question about um, uh, going back to the charity. Um, um, you said um, if mm. and um, if they don't um, use it wisely, but we don't know that, do we get um, a reaction for it? Um, your voice cut out. <clears throat> Can you repeat that again? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, when we give um, any Lakshmi towards the charity and um, uh, we don't know if they're using it wisely or not. Um, so do we get the reaction for it if they don't um, use it properly, right way? Well, you should know how to give in charity. Uh, yes, you can get a reaction if they misuse that money. Um, you won't get a bene any benefit for giving in charity, but uh, you should be very careful to know when you give in charity and how it's going to be used. Okay. Therefore, you, they, the uh, Bhagavad Gita explains giving charity in the mode of goodness, in the mode of passion, in the mode of ignorance, and giving charity uh, in transcendence. So, uh, if you read the 17th chapter, there's charity in the three modes. So, uh, yeah, if you give money to a, a person who uses the money for intoxication or for some illicit or sinful activities, yeah, you'll get some reaction for that. Thank you, Maharaj. You be careful how you give in charity, but one should not give up giving in charity because giving in charity is one of the main features of uh, of a living entity's existence. Either either a materialist or a spiritualist should regularly engage in charitable uh, offerings. That's that's a principle of life for morality and for spirituality. As it says in the uh, in one Shastra, I can't remember what it was. I think it's Niti Shastra by, by um, uh, what's his name? Chandaka Pandit. Chandaka Pandit says, there's three things you should always be satisfied with and three things you should never be satisfied with. And the three things you should never be satisfied with is chanting the holy names. You can't get enough of that. Speaking the glories of the Lord. You can't get enough of that. And giving in charity. You can't get enough of that. <laughs> Maharaj, uh, this is Athena Bandhu Guru Das. So I would assume maybe it goes the same way. If, if I uh, make uh, prasadam uh, bread and give it to somebody and they use it, uh, you know, to make a, a sandwich that we wouldn't make as a devotee, then that's the same as what you just mentioned about charity. Would I understand that correctly? We should be careful. Uh, yes. well, no, knowing how our charitable gifts are being used, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I mean, yeah. yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, the extension of this question is like whenever we give charity, uh, charity means it's gone. Money, whatever you give, you got. So we, so we should not think about it, right? If uh, uh, you know, uh, means we, we should not be attached to that, right? Attached to the results and uh, whatever you have given, you should not be attached to the thing you have already, it's gone. So why do we get the karma when the other person spends that money in their, their benefit or spend it in the wrong way? And why do we get that karma? And also when we give, suppose we give donation to the temple. 
we don't know how the temple uh, devotees they are going to use that money if they use their in their um, household thing or something like that so do we get that karma also or if we donate to the temple which means is gone in krishna service no if you, if you give to the temple then the temple is supposed to be, is is known as an authorized place for accepting charitable gifts and we have to trust that those people who are in the position within the temple are going to make the best use as they say so therefore when they say well here is a charity and this is how the money should be used if you in good faith follow that and if they don't do it they get the reaction not you mm -hmm. because they are an authorized form of accepting charity okay but when you give it in a material way um, then that's a little different when you give it to devotees it's it's a lot different yeah thank you maharaj okay thank you no there's no karma for you don't worry about that <laughs> <laughs> because you gave it in good faith and you gave it to the right right place then uh, you'll get the benefit of giving that charity well, we're not interested in benefit anyway we're interested in uh that the money given will be useful for something for something spiritual yeah krishna maharaj hello uh, pranam so maharaj the extension to that question only so how do we know if um, they are using it in proper way or not if we question them is that a vaishnava aparad Hare Krishna uh, Maharaj, can you hear my question properly? Mm. Yeah, Hare Krishna Mataji, can you be louder? Yeah, louder, please. Okay, okay. Maharaj, an extension to that similar question. Uh, if I inquire about that, uh, whatever uh, the uh, donation that I have done, is that called as Vaishnava Aparad? How do I do if I, if I ask the person uh, whether it is properly did or not? Cure, um, how do I inquire? If I inquire, is that a wrong way? Um, or is that a Vaishnava Aparad? How can I understand that? Could you hear from Maharaj? If Otherwise, you, I will join. No, if, you, if you're giving in charity, you should know all the answers before you give and then give and then don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that you have to make an investigation about where your money went after you gave it. First of all, you understand, all right, this is, this is what the charity is about. This is how the money will be used. You know, when you give to materialistic charitable funds, they have hired people there. And so they pay people and they take a percentage of the money that's donated to, to pay the wages of the people that work. So you know that not all that money is going to go to the actual charity. <clears throat> And sometimes only a small portion goes. Well, when you're working with devotees, if you're giving to a temple or if you're giving to a, a spiritual project, then you just give. You should think ahead of time, just like right now during this coronavirus, there's been a lot of requests for, from temples to help support their needs because of the decline in uh, amounts of money coming in. So there have been requests and we send in some money to help the different temples. And it's up to them how to use it. We trust that the leaders who are in charge will use the money in the best possible way. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Yeah, no need to make it any investigation. <laughs> uh, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Uh, please uh, accept my humble obeisances on Gurushu Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for your uh, very, very wonderful uh, class. Uh, Maharaj, I had a question about... Um, 
uh, that you were saying uh, how the reaction to vamana dev uh, taking off the eyes of uh, uh, sukracharya and the form of a bug uh, that uh, solna jayapata kumarat said and all um, so uh, one more thing that was related to that was gandhari's uh, curse that um, yadu dynasty would be finished like how her uh, children were you know um, that there, there was no dynasty of kuru dynasty especially from her so how, and krishna says that he is beyond karma and how to understand uh, that uh, these activities uh, the lord is um, subjected to um, like somebody's curse um, something like that uh, this looks like as though he is under the control of karma uh, can he's, you he's not affected <laughs> The Lord is never affected by anything, either spiritual or material. He's he, he's transcendental in all situations. But what is happening around him, in terms of his leelas, are influenced sometimes by outside forces. But these influences are, are only happening because the Lord allows it to happen. He, that's a principle of existence that the Lord may allow things to happen because this is part of his plan for the whole, for how things should play itself out. The Lord is, is using other people in order to facilitate his desires. It's like the battle of Kurukshetra, you know, he said, I'm not going to fight. And, uh, and so, but when it came time to uh, defend Arjun, his whole his plan changed, and he fought anyway, and he fought against Bhishma Dev. But that was that was Bhishma Dev's desire, and also the Lord's desire to give mercy to Bhishma Dev. So everything on the when the what, what happens in the Lord's leelas, as far as he is concerned is transcendental. He never touches the material energy, nor is he affected by anything. We also have the example of, okay, so there was one devotee, his name was Pundali. So you know Ranchar, right? You know the story of Ranchar? Uh, uh, your, your, your volume went off again. Uh, uh, I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yes, Maharaj. Yes, the Ranchor is uh, Krishna running away in the battlefield. No, not not that one. What is it? Uh, not Ranchor. Uh, what's his name? Um, when Krishna came to see his devotee Pundali, the Pundali was taking care of his parents. Yeah, Vital not Vital. Vital, yeah. Vittal. So. Um, when he came to see Pundali, Pundali told Krishna, you wait, I'm busy, I have to take care of my family. So Pundali, I mean, Krishna stood on a brick with his arms at his waist and like that waiting. And then when Pundali didn't come out, he just manifested himself in that form and left. And that became a worshipful deity. <laughs> So is Krishna affected by Pundali's decision not to see him? No. Uh, <laughs> he, he, that was a pastime so he could manifest that form in, in order to show the glory of his devotee. So, mm. so the, the Lord might interact with the devotional the, the devotees there. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And so he may do that, but that's part of his leelas anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thanks. Are you off? Yeah, wait one minute. I'll be right with you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, it's so, uh, I mean, you clarify things so nicely. Uh, you know, like teaching to a kindergartner. Thank you so much, Bhara. Yeah, he, Krishna explains he never touches this material world. Although he interacts 
uh, in the material world, but he doesn't touch the material world, nor is he affected by the activities. Of he remains transcendental. But when it comes to the love of his devotees, he acts and reacts accordingly. Mm. Or to fulfill his pastimes, just like, uh, you know, he, what happened was the uh, Yada dynasty became so powerful. So, uh, and Krishna's thinking, what am I going to do now? This dynasty is, is becoming so powerful that they're causing havoc. So Krishna arranged for the Yadas dynasty to act completely against their own nature. So they fought against themselves, killed themselves, and that was Krishna's arrangement so they could all return back to their positions in the heavenly planets. So that's explained in the purports how Krishna arranged the whole thing for the Yadu dynasty to to fight amongst themselves. And they would never do that. But that was Krishna's arrangement. So that's another, another example. You can see how Krishna will work with the material energy to fulfill his desires. I see you're traveling. No, it's a uh, school time for. Uh, it's your uh, favorite picture, uh, Maharaj, where you have uh, served for so long. Oh, this so, is my one of my favorite pictures. Yeah, like this way, you are in uh, in remembrance of us. Whenever we come here, you had told that how for so many um, uh, days you had cleaned uh, the altar. This is from. New Vrindavan in the uh, in the ashram where you stayed. Brahmachari. Yeah. yeah, that's Srila Prabhupada taking darshan of Radha Vrindavan Nath. And Radha Swami, you can't see him, but he's standing on the other side of the altar uh, looking at Srila Prabhupada. That was my Prabhu Desh for many years. I served those deities, Radha Vrindavan Nath, Gornitai, and then Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Maharani on the other part of the altar. Yeah. Maharaj, this was in the farm, uh, the first temple in the farm. Is that where it is right now? Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we happened to go there uh, three years back when we were there. We spent almost two hours in that area just looking into and remembering all the difficulties you have gone through. Yeah, difficulties are part of life. <laughs> we're still going through them. <laughs> and that time we met the Barsana Maharaj and Barsana Maharaj was uh, describing how all the brahmachari used to get up at 2.30 in the morning, uh, take the axe and break the ice and take the bucket of water and pour on themselves to take a Mangalarti bath. Yeah, it's highly recommended. <laughs> we recommend uh, those of you who want to understand the deeper uh, philosophy of Krishna consciousness, you should perform these Similar austerities. <laughs> you can you can put water in your bathtub and then put ice in it and then freeze it. And then the next morning you break it and take a bath. So that time we visited Bahulavan, we visited uh, the old workshop building, even though they don't allow it to go, we uh, passed through that and we had a Maharaja's uh, class there on Bahulavan Hill. Well, you're very fortunate to get the association of Varsana Maharaj, which is very rare and hard to get. He's such a great soul, he's a very special personality. 
stays within New Vrindavan and he's cultivating uh, the beautiful area known as Barsanadam, which is uh, a section of New Vrindavan which he's developed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we learned that he was assigned a task of uh, plowing the land and making it cultivable. And even today, he is using the machines and uh, clearing the lands and making sure that land is available for devotees and serving Krishna. So great, great uh, austerities. Yeah, he's, if you listen to him speak Krishna Kata, you will be amazed. When he speaks Krishna Kata, it's spontaneous and it's so beautifully described. Um, he is a very special, special, special personality. All the Shila Prabhupada disciples are special, but some of them are very special, yes. Yeah, to get Maharaj's association, you have to go to New Vrindavan. And even if you go, you have to search and search out that association. So. We were lucky. We had a chance and uh, we stayed there for almost six days. And within those six days, we got to meet him a couple of times. Yeah. He gives wonderful classes on, on, on Krishna Kata, Krishna Leelas, Krishna's appearance days. Yes, it was a very wonderful class he has given on the top of the hill when uh, the first time the new Bahulavan temple was inaugurated and Prabhupada came there for two days and Prabhupada had given a class on the temp uh, hilltop. So that was the memory recollection we had in those uh, in that session basically. Good. Wonderful, thank you. So when okay. I saw the picture, I could not resist myself to talk about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for Lalita, Lalita Angi. Thank, Thank you for sharing that uh, wonderful picture. Thank you, Maharaj, for your association and you know incredible, invaluable moments that we spent here. Uh, your uh, deity of uh, Namacharya Haridas Thakur. Whenever we say Premadvani and offer obeisances. Uh, he blesses us with his uh, remembrance. Also, thank you for letting us pray for your disciple Janaki Nath Prabhu. I remember him often and pray for him. Oh, please. I did. Your prayers are working because he seems to be doing much, much better now. I was with. I was speaking to him on Zoom last night, and he looks very, very good, despite four operations and two or three times with chemotherapy and other forms of, of medicines. He remains vibrant, strong, positive, and still preaching Krishna consciousness. It's amazing. It's all the prayers of devotees like you. Maharaj, it's your, it's your costless mercy and your special blessings and your heart to your disciple, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Okay, so we'll stop there. Please have a wonderful Brahmana Dwadasi, Ikadasi Brahmana. And also take time to remember Srila Jiva Goswami. Today is also his appearance day for those of you who are in the US. Um, Jiva Goswami was the most proficient, a prolif a prolific writer on. Um, transcendental knowledge, he composed 400,000 verses, making up many, many books on Shastra. He's famous mostly for his Sandarvas, which are the deep spiritual teachings, along with the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Um, everyone should read Sandarvas. It's quite voluminous, but it's worth the time. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll see you again next Friday. Is that correct? Yes, Maharaj. Okay.
Okay, I look forward. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Sandavat Pranam, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much for the wonderful class. Hare well, thank you. And Dina Bana Gore, my obeisances to you and your good wife, Lalita. Thank you. Hare Krishna, thank you. thank you. Nice to see you both. Thank you so much. Maharaj, there is Thank a question on the chat. There is a what? There is a question in the chat window, Maharaj. Okay, let me see. No. This is from Rashmi. Can we give charity in the name of departed souls in case if we have misgiving charity to them when they were present in this material world? Uh, what would that charity be? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think the best thing you can do for departed souls is uh, become Krishna conscious. And by the power of your Krishna consciousness, you can push them on to higher and higher realms of existence. And at the same time, you can offer beautiful prayers for the, for, to Krishna that showed his mercy upon them. I think that would be the best charity. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Okay, thank you so much, Maharaj, for your wonderful lecture, for your association. Thank you so much. Now we can offer businesses. Vancham Kalpar Vishakarpa, Sindhu Evacha, Patita Nam Pavi, No Veshwe, Purnamonama, and then Koti Veshwan, the Kija, Srila Prabhupada Kija, Shiman Pavitan Kija, Vamali Chikija, His Holiness. Um, Chandmoli Maharaj, Thank you.